The Paper Mario fan base has been quite aggressively ripped in half. The people who enjoyed the older games and their style of storytelling, RPG elements and expansive worlds, and those who are completely and undeniably wrong. As of right now, there are six total Paper Mario games from across the last four generations. These include Paper Mario for the Nintendo 64, Paper Mario the Thousand Year Door on the GameCube, Super Paper Mario for the Wii, Paper Mario Sticker Star and Mario and Luigi Paper Jam for the 3DS, and Paper Mario Color Splash for Wii U. Now, four of these games represent the Paper Mario franchise fairly well, to varying degrees of success. But despite that, there still seems to be a running theme of the games lessening in quality and progressively settling for something we don't really want. Hello and welcome to another episode of How To Make A Proper Sequel, the running series that lasts about as long as you watch it. If this video flops whilst the Luigi's Mansion 1 skyrockets in a week and then stops again, then I'll just say it was a fluke of some kind and throw some other content idea at the wall. Now looking back at the original Paper Mario, it had all the perfect elements for an original game. It had a unique world rooted within its art style, a stable gameplay and mechanic system with the room to be expanded upon, and an interesting light twist on the standard Super Mario story. With it, it introduced a plethora of concepts with which to play around with. Up comes along the holy grail of video game sequels, Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door, the game that every Paper Mario fan drops to their knees and kisses its feet. And this game does everything and more to expand the universe and gaming potential of the entire franchise. Battles are given an added boost in context as well as additive mechanics like audience interaction and strategy. The characters that come into play continue to keep the aesthetic of Mario characters with accessories, and the partners open up new moves and uses over the previous batch. The story is expanded into not just two parts, but several. From Mario's hero story, to Peach's prison story, to the villain's next step, and even a secondary villain slash ally guy. The story on its own, without even going into the theme and plot points introduced, work to create a crazy and investing drama of progression, as you see each recurring character pop up in other stories and places at random points in time. And of course, the direction the game takes from the original is far more experimental and un-Mario-like. It's a perfect wrapped up story of a game simply laid out in the Paper Mario world. And then comes Super Paper Mario, the turning point of the Paper Mario franchise, from experimental and standalone to watered down and generic. Though not entirely there yet, Super Paper Mario starts the gears of stripping the franchise of its previous features, turning gameplay from 3D RPG down to 2.5D platformer, transforming partners from the residents of the Paper Mario world to denizens of a new and uninteresting species, defined by a shape and a pair of eyes. Though the story holds its own, keeping along with the idea of pushing the Mario characters beyond their boundaries and simple roles. Same can be said with the theme of the plot, continuing the daring and off-brand approach to the world's lore. And then we get Paper Mario Sticker Star, the epitome of disappointment and bland branding. The partners are gone, the gameplay warped, and the story having about as much content as about an eight-page nursery book. This was a truly experimental time for the Paper Mario team, as they were trying to put the Mario back in Paper Mario and in doing so, stomped on any who had grown to adore the unfolding franchise. Taken aback by the infamous backlash that game had to offer, the Paper Mario team created the next attempt to rile fans back in, Mario & Luigi Paper Jam. Though not entirely a Paper Mario game and handled by an entirely different development team, it was more of a Paper Mario crossover homage kind of deal, and it was received fairly well, but not particularly for its paper elements. The introduction of a third Mario brother incorporated well into the already established Mario & Luigi gameplay, and many of the new concepts and mechanics brought on by Paper Mario's paperness worked wonders for the innovation of the game. However, the representation of the Paper Mario franchise through Paper Mario and his fellow characters was... lacklustre. With all elements of their existence continuing to sprout the sticker star method of sticking to Mario rather than sticking to paper. The residents of Paper Mario aren't Goombas with bandanas or sunglasses, and the Toads don't have hairstyles, they're simply naked in default Paper Mario form and the attacks Paper Mario provides to Mario and Luigi of this universe all entirely exist with a concentrated focus on his skin rather than his skills. His gimmick is that he's paper, and there's nothing more to him beyond that. He doesn't know how to jump an infinite amount of times because he has a power bounce badge, there's just a long line of him because he's duplicatable. But of course, the game did fairly well, both through sales and critical response, it was somewhat a solid game. 
So with more confident footing, the Paper Mario team decided to settle, and with it came Paper Mario Color Splash, the debatable next installment of the franchise. Is it good? Does it go back to its roots? Is it truly a revival? No. The writers of this game saved the game, but only really halfway. The world looks wonderful, it's presented with the highest of quality and context in mind, its characters are funny and diverse, at least on the inside, and there are plenty of funny moments to be found throughout the world of this Paper Mario. But at the same time, these ancient concepts from over 10 years ago are still long missing. There's no ensemble of partners, the gameplay continues to warp, and the story remains bland and watered down, formulaic even. Of course, this is all debatable because it is an enjoyable game. You will find yourself having fun in a lot of places whilst playing through the game. So what is it doing wrong? Well, sure, it's a nice game, standalone, but it's a sequel. And as a sequel, it sucks. So how can it be resolved? Let's start with the current team's latest misconception. We don't play golf in miniature, we play miniature golf. It's exactly the same here. Now between Super Paper Mario and Paper Mario Sticker Star, there was a change in development team. Beforehand, within Intelligent Systems, the role of director was given to Ryota Kawade as they manned the first three games of the franchise. However, from this point, the task was taken to Naohike, Aoyama, and Taro Kudo. Kudo would also go on to be the main writer for both Sticker Star and Color Splash. Understandably, the Mario and Luigi game was controlled by an entirely another team from Alpha Dream. However, the influence of these two is likely to be substantial, considering the similarity to the newer games rather than the older titles. With this shift in development team, it's clear there was also a shift in the approach toward Paper Mario games. Instead of perceiving the Paper Mario world as a universe of its own with simply a unique art style, the team instead focused on placing Mario sorely into a world of paper. Thus, the characters weren't just paper thin, but the houses they lived in were cardboard, the clouds hung up by string like a real life work of art. Now that on its own isn't a particular issue, but the defining traits of the Paper Mario characters were stripped away to be just Mario characters in paper form. The intensive diversity of each individual toad, for example, to create a clearly defined character and personality from the previous games was taken away and replaced with just the default look. They can have different colours, but then so can everyone else. The most defining feature that can be produced now is a fold, which again can just be duplicated. And in the rare case that there is a costume change, they continue to be duplicated and categorised as simply another label of Toad. This, in its simplest form, is lazy and unintuitive. There is no objective improvement in using generic Toads over personalised ones, unless it is within the character's point to be as bland as possible. And it's inconvenient for the player. If your user base literally cannot recognise your characters in your established worlds, then the visual design has failed the player and its fundamental purpose. No fan would want this over this. It's just an abhorrent move to regress with. Additionally, many of the characters are throwaways, surprise, surprise, only popping in with one-liners to be collected and used once. The moment their time in the spotlight is used, their personalities become about as thin as their bodies. <laughs> Whereas in previous games, each character had some kind of deepened point to their character and were well rooted into the universe they traversed, the newer games simply plant characters in there to be filler. Now to be fair, most players may not try to look into the deep backstories of your average street walking Goomba, but at least it was an option. Bowser experienced journeys from the generic villain to the underappreciated villain, the guy who got left behind and isn't with the times anymore, before becoming the victim himself and tacked onto a kind of hero type role instead. And after his moment of redemption as a well-rounded and adaptable character, he returns back to his generic form, not boasting about his strength or giggling to his minions or right hand hag. He's not on a journey of his own away from or attached to Mario's story. He hasn't got his own argument with characters behind the scenes or fun mini missions of his own to partake in. He's just there to be evil at the end of the day, aided only by the gimmick MacGuffin of the game. Which takes us to our next point. Modern Paper Mario games have pressed themselves into an odd corner for some reason. By taking away the RPG elements, each instalment relies on pushing out something new mechanic-wise in order to draw players into another game. 
The games can't just advertise themselves as another Paper Mario game, and the story certainly isn't something to gush about, but instead it's the gimmicks. It's Mario fights Bowser, but now he's using stickers to attack. It's Mario fights Bowser, but now he uses cards to attack, and he shoots paint everywhere, and he can cut out and make paths of his own. These gimmicks don't add much to the game beyond adding more buttons for you to press to actually hit a guy. Literally in Color Splash, you need to slide up multiple cards you want to use, hold each one down to color them in, select a button saying you're ready to go, and then swipe them up one more time to put them onto the top screen. Yeesh. And why is it that these gimmicks aren't even implemented more heavily into the world? Why is it that only toads are occasionally stuck onto surfaces through stickers? Why is it that cards appear just like any other item in the game? Why couldn't it be a matter of the world is literally ripped apart in places and you have to use stickers to piece everything back together? Or that characters already own cards and use them as some kind of currency? Or that they had uses simply beyond using up paints to use moves? What if they were already known as being some kind of mystical item and then it became such a revelation that paint was the thing that empowered them to do what they do? What if it was such a crazy thing that you could spawn a Goomba out of a card? The gimmicks shoved down the player's throat in these new installments are tacky and underutilized. Beyond just the fact that they change up the gameplay, they could be far more integral to how the Paper Mario universe of that game works out. If you're gonna envelop a new Paper Mario game with some quirky gimmick, give us something that is more rooted into the world the game brings. Sure, it can change up the combat system, but it could also be used as an element of how the story opens up. Why are they here? What can they do? How were they discovered? What is their purpose beyond giving Mario moves? Can anyone else use them? Does anyone abuse them? Now maybe those kind of questions lean more into the magical stars that get introduced to every Paper Mario game. But then, why does there have to be multiple elements for everything to work? Like, for Color Splash, why are there paint stars, but also paint elements, but also cards, and also the weird pathfinding cutout tool? Why is it that only the paint stars and elements are what the villain wants, and the cards are just a thing in the world that everybody uses nonchalantly? And pathfinding is just... there? What is their point? Why not incorporate it more strongly? Sure, it's supposed to actually use the console controls and it's just filling in a quota, but why not make it do more? So like, sure, the cards are powered by paint, so why isn't there some kind of extra element to them? Why isn't that more important? Why is it just there? Give us a gimmick that's well rooted, that's all I'm trying to say. If Mario can suddenly make the world 3D, have there be a secret 3D world for there to be explored, like a hidden dimension within the ordinary two dimensions, a giant secret for Mario to expose. If Mario can use stickers, have them interact with the world as stickers. Stop a leak using a sticker, make Mario become a sticker. I don't know, these gimmicks are hard to make content with. If Mario has cards now, make them an element of the story. Have characters in the world of Color Splash worship the paint they have since it's clearly some kind of life force to them. Have them host paint festivals or centralize their lives around this thing that grants their world life. Why would they just ignore the very soul of their world if losing color means losing all aspects of being alive or existence? Even if it's just a small band of characters in the world, having it be a magical thing that Mario has and everyone else requires just doesn't quite sit right with me. At the very least, why doesn't anyone ever worship the stars that are found nearby to them? If they're clearly a magical thing, why would you just ignore it and set up a cafe nearby when it's literally glimming and humming to you in the background? If the next Paper Mario game introduces the gimmick of laminated paper, maybe it makes you waterproof or super slippery and powerful. Maybe it grants mobility options or bounciness or reflectiveness. How would the characters of the world react to this crazy material? Would everyone want to own it? Is it for the rich only? Are people cautious of it? Do only workers wear them for dangerous missions? Do they upgrade tools that everyone else uses? Can it have any more applicability beyond upgrading Mario's moves? For no particular reason? Or better yet, make the magical stars be the thing that gives you moves. It's been done in the older games and it works. It's classic progression. Oh, but of course. Modern Paper Mario games aren't about being Paper Mario games, they're about being Paper and Mario. The game part seems to be the biggest afterthought. Obviously, these games look stunning, they push their systems for a HD rendition of the art style and place more onto keeping the look realistic and papercraft. 
But then the next step beyond the baseline of aesthetics is what looks good next? Is it 3D real life objects and their cartoony animations? Is it a variety of colour palettes and the diverse splotches of colour spread across the world? Is it the act of seeing coloured logos and weapons? Or the different arenas the game designers can produce? Regardless, it's not about creating an investive, coherent path for the hero. As a start, obviously, the latter games decided to start branching away from the linear format of chapter progression by severing the idea of a single path and instead opening multiple ones. But in doing so, they made the places you went to less coherent in the world of Paper Mario. And it really, it made it more linear than ever. And they did this simply by painting the unfoldable open world of the previous games into levels. Now, sure, every chapter was always rooted in a certain location, so you could perceive it as being a level, but in the later games, these levels became less of a large open location and more into narrow pathways we've come to associate with Mario platformers. So because of this, it was no longer the case that Mario discovered that he needed to go to a city in the sky, so he went back to town to try and find a blimp ticket to go to the city in the sky. And that blimp ticket alone would require a side story arc to be completed between three residents of the main town. That being the Don Boss of the Underworld who can easily grant Mario the ticket and his daughter's attempt to run away with his loyal subordinate. Now though that path may sound more convoluted than anything, what it does achieve is creating a strongly rooted path for Mario to get to the city in the sky in a way that supports how the Mario world functions. He didn't just hop into world 3-1 and start climbing higher into the clouds, battling pointless enemies and collecting a bunch of hammer moves on the way. He had to earn a ticket, and he had to take a blimp that had been foreshadowed as an option since coming to this town, alongside other modes of transportation like boats and trains. This is linear, sure, but it makes sense. In modern games, Mario could just go in any direction, and that's okay, because he just has to get to the end of that direction. They will have to go back and take another direction later. Just this time, the player is entirely in control. So sure, you don't have to touch the desert until you've done absolutely everything else first, but it's not nearly as investing as having a story element directly lead you into it. Because in these small, optional pathways, Mario's rarely achieving much. There's a star waiting for him at the end of the path. Go collect it. Oh, there's multiple now. Go through the path twice then. Now sometimes these levels come with mini side stories of their own. Collect the toad's clothing scattered across the path. Color in the toad's house. Play the mini game they have set up here. All of these examples are far inferior versions of what we've had in the past. And it feels too set up. Less so a story section you're completing and just a puzzle because that's just what you have to do. And across the entire storyline, this manner of progression will stay the same. Because the classic rules of progression have been scrunched up and thrown away. Battling enemies doesn't make you stronger, you don't gain levels, you don't increase your health, your moveset or equipable items. There aren't equipable items. You'll be rewarded collectibles for conducting fights. Collectibles that you use to fight. So why bother battling at all? You gain strength in your ability by collecting the optional thing that allows you to fulfill more optional things if you collect enough of said optional thing. And your health gets bigger as you get further through the story. It just happens. This is a pathetic route of hero progression. It makes it so that the Mario you start with is, for the most part, the same as the Mario at the end. Only difference being, he may or may not wield more of an ability and he lives longer. But his moves didn't get particularly stronger. If anything, they just are because of the location he's in. He didn't learn anything particularly new in ways of moves, but again, it's just a matter of using what he finds. And he doesn't grow as a character because, well, it's Mario, admittedly, he rarely ever did. The only change that happens is the change that occurs around Mario, which more often than not is just the story elements handed to you on a platter which you likely forgot about anyway as most of it just gets lost to time after their moment in the limelight is gone. All we need is simple progression. It's storytelling 101. Because otherwise, it seems more like Mario's been on autopilot for the past 30 hours. He's got his tools, so he just uses them on repeat until, whoa, uh -oh, he's made it to the final boss. Time for the climax, and he he's gone and got his girl. Uh, where what happened again? My brain shut off. If you're going to take away RPG elements from a story-focused game, then at least give us some kind of progression. 
show us that something is brewing as we wander along these pathways to the end. And if you can't do that because of the levelistic format of your game, then change it. With story comes progression, and if presentation gets in the way, then you've got a neatly wrapped, terrible product. You know what would be a good icon of progression that would work perfectly in the backtracking choose your own path adventure? Mobility options! Yet another element that was lost to time in the older games. Remember when you could slip into small spaces by turning paper thin? Or when you could roll up into a ball and roll under tiny crevices? Swim on water or glide through air? Or how you could upgrade your jump to ground pound or spring you upwards? Remember how those were integrated into several areas across the overworld to allow you to discover new places and reopen older ones? Remember how you could slip past prison bars, but also gap between houses and even sewer drains? Or how you could resist wind blasts using this one ability? Whatever happened to that? Oddly enough, these abilities were the most modern Paper Mario thing in the old Paper Mario games, literally looking at how a Mario made out of paper could traverse. These mobility options for Mario were vital to creating an open yet investing world for the players back in Thousand Year Door. With how much Mario could pop between worlds, it allowed him to rediscover new places with his abilities. And with how much the newer games want you to go back on yourself and choose different paths, wouldn't this be the perfect place to incorporate hidden secrets to be unlocked later in the game? That way simple levels aren't just explored once and never touched again. Perhaps these secrets held things that could be found across the entire world of the new Paper Mario game, something that could piece the whole adventure together. What if they were called star pieces or were some other collectible you could find in each and every level? And what if bringing them all back to the central land granted you access to something as a reward for truly exploring the new world of Paper Mario, whilst making everything feel more closely knitted together? Especially if these abilities were found in diverse locations but were to be used across all of the levels. Wouldn't that just be something? Wouldn't it be nice to not have to walk across a path once just because it's in your way and doesn't have any further meaning or purpose beyond fulfilling a quota on a game for that section? And what if those mobility options were complemented by further options provided by you by a progression of sidekicks who could do more things for puzzle related elements of the game, such as hiding Mario underneath the ground or kicking a shell in front of you, chucking a mobile explosive or lighting up any encapsulating darkness? Could you imagine the diverse range of options that could be given if you were able to combine all of these different elements into some kind of advanced and rewarding puzzle game? They'd simultaneously contribute to the level design of each level, granting them a multitude of options to utilize within their areas, as well as would highlight a sense of progression for Mario as his movesets increased and improved his accessibility as he rolled through the world and its story. Now doesn't that sound so much more functional for a game? Now, here's some new mechanics that could be introduced to a new Paper Mario sequel if absolutely none of these old ideas were recyclable anymore. Upgrade Mario's walk so that he can dash ahead, potentially bashing into walls to reveal hidden openings or knocking down shelves. Upgrade Mario's hammer so he can make the ground quake, unraveling something sturdy nearby to him. Give Mario a spin attack with his hammer, perhaps to dizzy enemies or spatter an ability in a lot more places. Upgrade Mario's drum so that he glides downwards slowly as if his paperiness makes him lighter, great for getting over gaps. Allow Mario to fold, whether that's into new origami forms to take on different elements, or maybe for something that doesn't need to be so overcomplicated, like literally shrinking his size to waddle through small tunnels. Allow Mario to stretch his body, because he's paper, right? Give him certain walls that he can stick to, maybe he can have gloves that are stickers, so he could climb up particular walls. Allow Mario to lie flat down, avoiding any obstacles that swing at him. Perhaps even some of these abilities transition smoothly into simple partner abilities. Maybe someone else can climb up certain walls, like a spider type enemy or a wiggler. A spinner or even just a Koopa can have Mario climb on top to spin him around rapidly. Regardless, to strip away all of these from Mario's overworld moveset while simultaneously making the overworld narrowly pathed yet open to exploration in any direction is just counterproductive and would need some serious tweaks to be a more functional format. So who's to blame? Well, clearly there was a change at a certain point. Though even during before that moment fully came to fruition, there were elements of the less enjoyable aspects of modern Paper Mario game. Replacing locations with platform levels was first brought up in Super Paper Mario. 
literally in 2D for the most part. It also provided us with a specific gimmick of switching between 3D and 2D, as well as forced console controls within the game with the Wii pointer revealing Tippy's ability to find invisible things on very rare occasions. Not to mention it was the transitional period between partners being good to not good with one good one to not existing at all, apart from the good one, who is now bad. In the game, each world was separated from everything else, not just because of the portal doors, but also with how unintegrated everything was from everything else, with the exception of the growing black hole in the distance. Its residents were taken away from the Mario character format and replaced with basic shapes and bouncy fairy-like animations, and the Mario enemies that did pop up were stripped down to their basic form. They were just the enemy. None of them were really residents of the world like beforehand. And at this point, badges were already gone. So who did all this? What changed behind the critically acclaimed Thousand Year Door and Super Paper Mario? Well, starting off, it wasn't simply intelligent systems who were manning the Super Paper Mario project. It was additionally Nintendo SPD, the Nintendo Software Planning and Development Team, who helped to co-produce many external developer games. They're famous for all sorts of side games, from Super Princess Peach to Mario Party games. They're a real mixed bag of bad and good games. And they lingered on until Stick a Star, so perhaps it was simply them and their influence to take Mario back from Paper Mario. Of course, that was still directed by the original director of the previous games, so perhaps it was directly due to Naohiko Aoyama for their directional direction, or Taro Kudo and his vision for future Paper Mario games. It's surprising to think that Paper Mario took such a turn in this direction. I mean, Super Paper Mario was a great game overall. IGN even said, the writing is well crafted and humorous, but there's so much to read that it actually interrupts the flow of the game. Oh, I guess that could explain the less detailed story that progressed from that point. How did Paper Mario Stick a Star reviews go? 7s and 8s out of 10s? Awarded Best Handheld Game of the Year and well over 2 million sales? Hmm, maybe in the end, it wasn't entirely the change of teams that took down Paper Mario, but the people who played them in the first place. Regardless, I know what I like in my Paper Mario games. I like story, I like characters, I like progression, I like exploration, and I like depth, ironically. And though the latter games have blipped recently in regards to the requirements, I would wish for a great Paper Mario game with just some of the ideas I've sprinkled within this video, or just the concepts of them. It's kind of self-explanatory anyway. Perhaps we could have ourselves a proper Paper Mario sequel. And if reviews are anything to go by, then progressive levels should be making a return, the cutout ability will not, and there will be a lot less toads. We can dream. For now, my name's been Daz, you didn't really care, I hope you enjoyed this awfully ranty video, do check out my Twitch, my Twitter and my Patreon in the description, and I'll see you in a bit. Represent the parry- Now looking back at the p- The story is expanding to not- Taken aback by the infamous backlash that had- It was a- Let's start with the current team's latest mint that was given to Ryota Kawad- Ryota Kawade was given to Ryota Kawade, considering the similarity to the newer games rather than the old ones in these times. And once the the moment their moment, <laughs> most players may not try to look too deep into the deep. Most players might tr they could be more integral to how the they could be far more integral. The cards are power. So the cards are powered by paint. So why is this sign? So sure, the cards. If Mario can make the world 3D, have there be a seek if the for there to for there to be for there to be <coughs> <coughs> This is a long video, my lord. And he had to take a blimp that can Mario could just going any in the backtracking choice in the backtracking choose your own adventure in the back Ugh, I'm ill. <coughs> Chucking a mobile, potentially Gami forms <laughs> with the game's Wii U with the form. Now Hiko Oyama to now Hiko Oyama in this direction. I mean, are you kidding me? My nose. And I'll see you in a bit. 
God, I am ill. Ow. 